Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing today? No, no fan flipping intro today. No uh, funny ha ha singing song intro today. Um, this is a very serious video, a very serious topic. Um, and if you guys have watched my videos for a while, you know that when I feel that a topic is very, very serious, I just get right into it. So let's do that. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, Natalia Grace and the two series that have come out about her. The first one called The Curious Case of Natalia Grace and the second part, which is called The Curious Case of Natalia Grace, Natalia Speaks. I've been wanting to make a video response to this story for quite some time. In fact, when the first series came out, um, I wanted to make an immediate reaction to that. And then very soon after that, I heard that there was going to be a follow-up part to the series, which was called The Curious Case of Natalia Grace, Natalia Speaks. Because the first part of the series was told pretty much from the point of view of her adoptive father, um, Michael Barnett. And the second part was going to be Natalia coming out and sharing her part of her story. And so... In, instead of coming out and doing two different responses, I wanted to wait and see what Natalia had to say in the second part of the series, and I wanted to um, do a complete response to all of that. Uh, I also, in watching this, at the same time that the second part of the series came out, um, was around the same time that Gypsy Rose Blanchard was released from prison. And I was watching this huge amount of popularity that Gypsy Rose Blanchard was getting from being released from prison. I had a lot of feelings about that whole story and her getting a lot of popularity and fame and things like that. And I, that was another story that I'd watched very closely. For those of you that don't know, um, I have a true crime book club that I run with my good Judy Mel. Hey Mel, how are you? Uh, the link is below. All you have to do is join the Facebook group. Um, We've taken a little bit of a hiatus, but we're coming back in February. I will be announcing that on my booktube channel here shortly. Uh, we just finalized our book last night. We'll be covering the uh, Murdaugh murders in uh, February. So that will be our book for February. And um, so anyway, uh, I, I watch a lot of true crime documentaries. I watch a lot of life documentaries. I watch a lot of documentaries in general. And so when um, I started, you know, seeing these two stories kind of come out at the same time, it was interesting to me and watching having watched both of the series, that Gypsy Rose Blanchard was getting tons and tons of attention, and Natalia Grace was being very much put down from the public eye. And the stories, to some degree, um, are, are, well, they're very, very different stories, but in, in the fact that they were both children when their stories originated, it was interesting to me the public perception of how people viewed Gypsy Rose Blanchard versus Natalia Grace. Now, let me tell you how I found out about this story, okay? I live in Indianapolis, Indiana. I grew up on the north side of Indiana, in, or Indianapolis, in Carmel, Indiana. And the story starts taking place in Westfield, Indiana. Carmel, Indiana, and Westfield, Indiana are about 10 minutes apart. So where the story takes place, the majority of it, is about 10 minutes from where I grew up. Um, my mother-in-law actually lives in Westfield, Indiana, probably about two minutes, like a two-minute drive from Natalia Grace, in, in pretty much the same neighborhood that Natalia Grace lived with the Barnetts. Um, and my cousin Caroline, who is in many of my videos and I talk about often, she lives probably about five minutes from where Natalia Grace grew up with the Barnetts. So... When I heard about this story, and originally one of my friends told me to watch this. They said, oh my god, you have to watch this story. So I watched it and literally just like binged right through it. I think it, the first one was like six episodes or something like that. And I just like binged straight through it. And it was so unbelievable to me, this whole story. And I was very much taken in all honesty too, like the public. Like it's, I, I didn't really know what to think. So before I get into this, for those of you, I, I just want to tell you, I, this is not going to be a timeline of everything that's happened with the story. And in, in fact, the story is so complicated at this point that I don't even know. I, any, I, I've seen a lot of like, you know, true crime sto uh, do, uh, YouTube channels and other people do like a breakdown in the timeline of the story and things like that. This video is just going to be based on my opinions of what I think of watching both documentaries. Um, and so I, I just want to make that very, very clear. I do want to, before we get into this, read just a Wikipedia breakdown of Natalia Grace and who she is. <clears throat> Natalia Grace Barnett, who has now legally changed her name to Natalia Grace uh, Mans. Mans is her new adoptive family. Natalia Grace Barnett is a Ukrainian-born American with dwarfism who in 2010 was adopted by an American family, but abandoned by them two years later. Barnett's adoptive parents, 
Christine and Michael, who I'll be referring to in this video, claimed that Barnett was a legal adult, and in 2012, they successfully sought saw, saw a court order legally changing her birth year from 2003 to 1989. However, on August two, 2023, DNA test by True Diagnostic confirmed, and this is in the newest part of the documentary series, uh, however, in August 2023, DNA tests by True Diagnostic confirmed that Grace was absolutely, or was about 20 years old, meaning she was around 9 years old when her adoptive parents abandoned her. Let's just put that in perspective, okay? For all the people out there that are blaming Natalia Grace for this whole situation, let's just put that in perspective, okay? When her adoptive parents aged her up, okay, legally aged her up, um, with the help of a doctor who had very little interaction with Natalia Grace, when they aged her up, it relieved them of any responsibility, okay, which we find out is not necessarily true in the second part of the series. It released them, they thought, from any legal responsibility for Natalia Grace, okay? Um, and so then you have a nine-year-old living in an apartment by herself. Just Let's just put this in perspective for a second, okay? My nephew will be turning eight this weekend, okay? Um, I, he is very age appropriate at eight years old. I cannot even imagine in my wildest nightmare, I cannot even imagine, okay, him having to take care of himself, feeding himself, getting himself up, cleaning himself up, let alone the place that he lives in, being completely, you know, self providing for himself at nine years old. I cannot even imagine that. His older brother is 11. I can't even imagine that for him. So let's just put that in perspective for all these people that are like, oh, Natalia Grace is evil. She's nasty, blah, 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 whatever. Okay, all these things. We need to really put this in perspective. She was nine years old when this family abandoned her, okay? Now, what they found out was that due to her dwarfism, that they had more of a legal responsibility to take care of her, okay? Um, due to the fact of this disability, then they would have had, whether they had, if they had a child that they had adopted that did not have a disability, okay? Which was why they had to paint a nastier, more evil picture of Natalia Grace um, to make it seem even worse than it already was. Okay, so that comes out in the second part of the series as well. Um, meaning that she was nine years old when her adoptive parents abandoned her. Barnett is the subject of two television series, the 2023-2024 series, The Curious Case of Natalia Grace, retitled The Curious Case of Natalia Grace, Natalia Speaks, for season two, and the upcoming Hulu TV series, Untitled Orphan Project, okay? So, I have watched both of these series. I have to say that... In watching the first series, I didn't really know what to think. So it kind of goes in the first part of the series. I'm really going to just talk about the second part of the series because the second part of the series where Natalia speaks was really the one that baffled me the most, okay? When I watched the first part of the series, in all honesty, I did not know what to think, okay? They didn't talk about any mental health diagnoses in that series. They didn't talk about, you know, a lot. They tried to seek out, investigators sought out her birth mother, in the Ukraine. They found her. There was kind of like non-definitive um, uh, uh, definitive evidence of like at her actual birth date and things like that. They kind of actually glazed over it. And I have to say, one of the things that I think is so problematic about this documentary series um, in watching it, and like I said, I watch a lot of documentaries, okay? I, I probably in my lifetime have watched, I don't know, hundreds if not hundreds upon documentaries. I've seen the top 100 list of documentaries, top 100 list of true crime documentaries and things like that. And, and, and also in running a true crime um, book club, one of the things that is very important to us is, is the story of the victim heard? Okay? Or are we sensationalizing it at the expense of the victim who paid the ultimate price? That's something that we discuss on a very regular basis in our True Crime Book Club. So whenever I'm watching a documentary, I'm always watching it as if, or thinking to myself, are the directors and the producers being objective to the point of view? Or are they sensationalizing parts of the story to sell the story? Okay? And when we're talking about Natalia Grace, the story is the life and times of Natalia Grace. Okay, so it's really at the expense, let's sensationalize the story, at the expense of this child who is mistreated and abandoned, okay, abused, mistreated and abandoned, at a very young age, taught to fend for herself, and then the second season we find out has mental health diagnoses that are very, very serious, okay? So for me, when I'm watching the show, now in retrospect, okay, I'm thinking to myself, a lot of the things that I was thinking, a lot of the things that I was wondering, 
was it the producers and the director's intent to sensationalize the story, to just hype it up and get attention for the story? Or did they really ever care about Natalia Grace? Did they really ever care about getting to the truth? For me, it's interesting in watching it and thinking back on what I thought. Because when I watched the first part of the series, they interview a lot of people. The whole story is told really through the eyes of Michael Barnett, who is her adoptive father, okay? Who, I have to say, seems unhinged at best, okay? So, and in the second part of the series, he seems unhinged at best as well. Um, so when you watch the first part of the series, it talks a lot about them adopting her and them thinking like on the night one of adoption um, that they they implicated that Michael said that his wife called him into the bathroom. He, she was giving a, a bath to Natalia and then Natalia had breasts and pubic hair. And this is probably one of the parts that sensationalized the most in the story because at that time she would have been like six or seven years old, okay? So when you're watching this and you're like, oh my God, this is like crazy. There's no way she can be six or seven years old and things like that, right? And so they go on and on and on about that, right? And then there's stories about the fact that Natalia Grace had her for her first period or was having her period and she was trying to hide it from them and things like that, right? When you find out in the second part of the series, Natalia alleges that um, her adoptive mother, Christine Barnett, was forcing her to use a tampon. We need, okay, <laughs> this is where I'm watching this show and I'm literally like crying watching this show, okay? Because we now know that at that time, she was seven or eight years old. All right. Now, having heard stories from my mother of when she went through having her first period and not knowing how to use tampons and things like that, having had stories of that from my friends, majority of my friends are women, and having them tell me many different stories from mothers who were fantastic and sat down and, and celebrated this transition in their life to other mothers that literally just put a box of tampons on their bed and they had no idea what to do with it. Let's just imagine for a second what it might be like to be seven or eight years old and being forced, okay, to put a tampon in your vagina at seven or eight years old. I mean, when we talk about the fact of like, is Natalia an evil person? I think we're, we're mispointing who, who the really nasty person is in this story. It's a really, it's a really sick and twisted story, okay? And so... And, and Christine Barnett has apparently come out on Facebook. I will read this post to you in a second. Well, in a couple minutes, I'll read it to you. She's apparently come out and made some statement and said a lot of this isn't true, right? But she basically addresses all the things that they talk about in the show. You know, I mean, is, there is going to be a third part to the series because at the very end of the show, after they come out with this huge bombshell, they say um, the story continues or something like that. So apparently there will be a third part to the series. I'm wondering if the third part will be that Christine Barnett ever finally says her piece because you don't hear from Christine Barnett, the adoptive mother, in two parts of the series. Now, I don't know about you, okay? But if I had written a book, okay, that garnered me $600,000 upfront money, I prided myself on being a mother, had adopted a child, okay, left her to be abandoned. Who cares what the story is at this point that you tell, okay, or that you think? DNA diagnostic evidence proves that the girl was nine years old when you abandoned her. Would you not want to clear your side of the story up? Would you not want to come out and share your part of the story? You're going to put a Facebook post up, okay? To me, that implicates guilt. That's just my opinion on that, all right? So when I'm watching this story and you watch the first part of it and all this happens and Michael Bernard Barnett is like, ah, ah, ah. I mean, it was like so much to even watch him in the show. You kind of bought, well, I kind of bought into the hype of the show. Okay. Not to mention they use several neighbors that Natalia Grace would go to their house and she would do things like just show up out of nowhere, okay? And just like want to talk to them. And then when she moved in this apartment in Westfield, when she was nine years old, okay? She would just show up. She would go to people's houses, things like that, right? Okay. They also implicate at that point that Natalia Grace, one of her neighbors who holds her ground in the second part of the season or series too, implicates that Natalia Grace was sexually inappropriate with kids in the neighborhood, was even sexually appropriate with men that lived in the neighborhood. Now, what's important to remember about this, okay, is that at that time, Natalia Grace would have been nine years old, okay? So you're not talking about a 25-year-old woman acting this way. You're talking about a nine-year-old girl, okay? Now, what we know about sexual abuse, which they lightly glaze over in the second part of the series, okay? What we know a lot about sexual abuse today is that many times 
that leads to people being exposed to sexuality at a very young age, okay? So if that were part of Natalia Grace's history, her having inappropriate conversations with people or whatever at nine years old would to some degree make sense if she had been exposed to that from a young age, all right? But they choose to glide over that part in the second part of the series, okay? They choose to glide over that part and leave it stand that Natalia Grace, because they want to sensationalize the story, to let you continue to speculate, speculate, well, really, is it really Natalia Grace that is that horrible of a person? So when I watch the first part of the series, they have a lot of neighbors, a lot of reputable neighbors, right, that just seem like good people, good family people. Uh, this one woman who won't let her daughter be around Natalia Grace anymore. Natalia confronts her in the second part of the series, and the woman basically has nothing to say. She's like, well, I just believed Christine and things like that. I mean, I just can't even imagine if I were in that position and I had done what this woman did. I think that my, I would just be like bawling my eyes out and being like, Natalia, I let you down. Like, I should have called the police. I should have speculated. I should have always been for the children. I, I, to me, it is so baffling watching that scene. The woman literally has very little emotion, okay? You have children. Your child was friends with this girl. And yet you were okay with her going to live in an apartment in Westville because you believed that the mother said she was 20 years old at that time, okay? You thought that was okay. You never once questioned it. I mean, it's baffling to me. And it makes me think back on when I grew up, okay, on this cul-de-sac in Carmel, Indiana with fantastic parents. I've talked a lot in my videos about being bullied in school for being gay and being bullied extensively about people, but that never happened on my street. And I've shared that story as well. And I don't know if that's because the parents were friends with my parents or they felt for me or whatever, but no kid was ever cruel to me on the street or bullied me for being gay. They always included me in things, right? And I can remember going to eat lunch at the neighbor's houses. And I can remember going to have dinner and sleepovers at the other neighbor's houses and stuff like that, right? And they cared about me and they cared about my mother when she became a single mother. They cared about us as a family. I can't imagine, okay? I mean, I grew up in an era where if you were, like, if you were out on the street and, and you, like, yelled at somebody, like, your neighbor, who was a good friend of yours to your parents, okay, would say, Peter, you don't speak that way. To, you know, I'm going to have to call your mother. So the fact that you have all these adults involved in this situation that could care less about Natalia Grace, right? It makes me really speculate. And, and they kind of glide over this in the second part too. Natalia insinuates it a little bit. But it really makes me wonder how much of their hatred towards Natalia Grace. She talks about it with Christine Barnett. And she talks about it with Christine Barnett's friend, one of her friends. But she doesn't really talk about it with the neighbors. I'm wondering how much of it is about her... Um, is is about all these people's um I don't know their uh their ignorance or their just their just their outlook on people with disabilities especially little people now I've done a video on this channel with one of my dearest friends she's been one of my best friends since I was 18 years old her name is Allie and she prefers to be identified as a little person and she has been on several TV shows she was on a Bravo show called Freak Show she was for the whole running of the show she was on Little uh, People or Little Women LA she's been in several movies she was a stunt do a double in I Am Legend for Will Grace, or Will Grace's child in the movie. She's been d done extensive shows, things like that, and she's done a video with me and we talked about it. She's also done a lot of YouTube videos and things like that. So, you know, I have talked to her a lot through the years. She lives in California now, so we don't talk on a much regular basis. I just got to see her in May for a while. Um, but, you know... I have talked to her extensively through the years of people's, their, their, how they look at her and how they, you know, like she drives a car and people are like, how do you drive a car? You know? And it's like this whole, I think, impression that people have, you know? And I think the whole, the idea of Natalia Grace you know, and her identity and things like that, that a lot of what was going in to people's perceptions of Natalia Grace being an evil person was that she had dwarfism. And I have to believe that that's a huge part of it. And the show doesn't really go into that. In fact, there was a couple in the first episode that Natalia Grace would run across the street and go to their house or run back through backyard through their house. And they were the ones that really convinced me the most because they were a very well put together family and things like that. And they would say, that Natalia Grace would call and be like, are you coming home? Can I come over? And whatever. Natalia Grace didn't feel safe in her home. Now, let's put this in perspective now, right? Like, I wish I would have interviewed that family for the second part. They did not, okay? 
But when you know now that at that time, she was seven, eight, nine years old, okay? And she's going over, she's scared to death to be in her own home, right? And she's going over to this couple that she trusts because they seem like a nice family to her, right? My parents got divorced in an era when nobody got divorced. My parents were literally one of the first people that I ever knew to get divorced. So when I would go over to other people's houses that had families and they ordered pizza and things like that, that was very comforting to me. That was a place that I found home, right? I didn't want to be. I've also talked extensively about my mother being an active alcoholic when I was growing up. I didn't want to be at home alone with my mom. So if I could go over and be at somebody else's house that was a family, then I felt more like I was at home. I can completely understand why Natalia Grace was going over to this couple's house and wanting to be there because she was assimilating this to home. She needed to find a home. That's all Natalia Grace has ever wanted was a home, okay? That couple was very implemental in planting this seed that Natalia Grace was this disgusting human being that needed to look, be looked down on and that she was the root of all the Barnett's problems, okay? So then in the first series, it goes on and she's in this Westfield apartment and she ends up getting kicked out because so many people are complaining about um, Natalia because she's going in and out of people's apartments. She's stealing food. She's going through their cabinets. Mind you, she's nine years old, okay? With probably at that point, because we need to talk about the idea of emotional development. At that time, she has the emotional development of probably a four-year-old, okay? She's had nobody raise her. Now, she had one adoptive family, okay, that then rehomed her to another adoptive family that has now abandoned her and put her in an apartment, okay? She has no developmental skills whatsoever. She was pulled out of school by her adoptive mother, Christine Barnett. So she has really no education, okay? And she's now living in an apartment at nine years old, okay? With which we know now is being left with very little. So then she gets kicked out of this apartment because of her horrible behavior, all right? Which this one woman in the second part of the series, this older woman was like, I don't care what you tell me. She was acting inappropriate and I know how old she was and blah, 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 all this kind of stuff, right? And then she holds to that. And I'm like, you literally, I mean, you have lived a life, okay? This is not, this woman is probably in her 60s. You have lived a life and you are that willing to look down on a child. You are blaming a nine-year-old child, okay? For inappropriate behavior. Well, there's mental health issues that come in, in the second part that they glide over. And I cannot believe that they glide over it, okay? So then it comes out and it they move her to an apartment in Lafayette, Indiana, okay? And they move her in this apartment with these stairs that she can't walk up in. And she's got to have, like, stools to, like, get to the counter. I mean, it's just, like, it's, it's, it's atrocious what they do to this girl, okay? And then they paint this whole picture out. There's this investigation that done. There's this court hearing that done. And Michael Barnett is basically relieved of all things and kind of smirks at Natalia and all this kind of stuff. And that's kind of how the first series leaves off, right? You, you, I left the first series really believing that Natalia Grace was the age of the Barnett set. And this is important, okay? Because production could have done the things that Natalia Grace did in the second season. They could have gone to a DNA diagnostic testing. They could have gone to the dentist that at the age of seven or eight or nine, okay, had evidence that told the mother what age she was based on her, her dental records, there were other doctors that they went to at that time. They didn't show any of that part one, okay? So they wanted to sensationalize the story. Now, why I think that is important that we talk about the, sensationaliz the sensationalization of Natalia Grace, okay? Is because you're talking about a human being with a real life, okay? This girl is not making shit tons of money off of these documentaries. She literally has a GoFundMe right now, okay, on her Instagram page. She's not making tons of money. She's not getting a book, do book deal, as I know of yet, okay? She should. She should sue, sue the hell out of all these people is what I think she should do, okay? So that's kind of how you're left with the first part of it. You feel a little bit sorry for her, obviously, but there's so many people that are siding against Natalia Grace that when you're watching it, I just was like, okay, it has to all be true. Like, she has, there's so many things they say that makes you want to think or make me want to think that this has to be true. She has to be older than she actually is. If she's not 20, then she's 17 or 18, but she has to be older, okay? And my mind kept on going to that very first scene when they adopted her that very first night, okay? The planted seed, all right? Now, I just read the Reese's Book Club for January, all right? I'm a huge reader. And the book is called First Lie Wins. Now, I'm not going to ruin the book for you because the book is fantastic. 
But the whole idea of the first lie wins, which is the title of the book, and this is this is shared early on in the book, so this will not ruin it for you. It's not going to spoil anything about the book. But the idea of the first lie wins is that if you are somebody that is a con artist, okay, or you are somebody that is lying to the world, or you are trying to manipulate a story, the first lie has to be one that is so believable, okay, that is so out there, that is so convincing, that is so bizarre that nobody would ever question that. And once that first lie is told and it is believed and it is won, then anything after that doesn't really matter because everybody's going to go back to that first lie. And for me, when I watched that first series, the first lie was the fact that Natalia Grace at six or seven, five, six or seven years old was in a bathtub, okay, with breasts and pubic hair. And the fact that uh, Christine Barnett at that point would think that this was a grown woman and call her husband in there and point to this girl sitting in a bathtub with pubic hair. I mean, the idea that this little girl is in a bathtub, okay, with adults pointing over her is so abusive to begin with. You know, when you think back on it, it's like the first lie won. You know, I just, it's like unbelievable to me, right? So then the first, the second season comes out. And I'm like, so I'm in Mexico when it comes out, okay? And I'm like dying to watch this show. And so when we were coming back on vacation, I'm like, I, I talked to my friend Nikki, who's part of the book club. Nikki had watched the whole series. She's like, you're going to die. And she's like, when you see the last 30 seconds of the show, it's just like unbelievable, right? So... We're sitting on the tarmac ready to take off. And I'm like getting ready to watch Thousand Pound Sisters and Vanderpump Rules and all this kind of stuff. And I go in and I literally just like real quickly, I download all the shows. Okay, there were six episodes of the second part, I think. So I download all the shows and I watch it and then I came home and I finished watching it, I think the next day or something like that. And I just was blown away by the second part of the series. So the second part of the series is that now Natalia Grace is living with her new family, okay? This pastor and his wife. And their name, their last name is Mans, M-A-N-S. And um, she has this great home with them and they love her and they've allowed her to be a teenager and grow up and things like that, right? And they love her. And so I'm watching all of this unfold and then she confronts Michael and Michael goes crazy and he's like, I can't do this, I can't do this, all this kind of stuff. And he's comparing her abuse to the abuse of Christine Bar uh, that he received from Christine Barnett. And I'm like, Okay, wait a second, all right? You are a grown man in your 40s, all right? And you're comparing the abuse that you suffered to a girl that literally suffered at the hands of your wife, okay? Was emotionally, physically, verbally abused, neglected, and abandoned, all right? Oh, but wait a second. You are a grown adult that also engaged in those things and also sat there and we're complicit to it because you never put a stop to it. And I'm sorry, there are some things that I just don't think I'm sorry are good enough for. And being complicit as an adult, sitting by and watching that abuse occur is not good enough for me, okay? I don't give a shit about your sob story. I, I don't care. And the thing is, is that Michael Barnett thinks that he's kind of like double jeopardy. You know, like, I went to trial once and I, this can't affect me. Well, that's not necessarily the case when you talk about civil suits. And more evidence has come out now. So, Michael Barnett, you might be eating your words. Just want to say, okay? So, I want to go through my notes because I have extensive notes about this. But the first thing that I wanted to say in this, before I get into it, this is a lot that I, I put this note to the very beginning. Two things that they don't go into depth in this uh, series, and I think that this is important because this feeds into the sensationalization, okay, of the story of Natalia Grace, and that is um, the story of her diagnosis of RAD, okay? And for those of you that don't know, RAD, and I have several different uh, places of research I've gone to, RAD is called Reactive Attachment Disorder, all right? And RAD is, and this is defined by the Cleveland Clinic, which is a very reputable uh, medical treatment facility. What is Reactive disor Attachment Disorder? Reactive Attachment Disorder, RAD, is a condition where a child doesn't form Healthy emotional bonds with their caretakers, parental figures, adoptive parents, often because of emotional neglect or abuse at an early age. Children with RAD have trouble managing their emotions. Okay, now this is important because for a brief period, okay, of a brief episode in part two, they mention that Natalia Grace has a diagnosis of RAD. Well, when they said that to me, I my ears immediately perked up, okay, because... 
for those of you that don't know, I've been sober for over 29 years. I'm actively involved in a 12-step program. I have many friends of mine that have a diagnosis of RAD, okay? Friends of mine that grew up in the foster care system, friends of mine that experienced extreme sexual, emotional, verbal abuse at a young age, friends of mine that were neglected at a young age, friends of mine that grew up in crack houses and drug houses and things like that, okay? That have been diagnosed with RAD, all right? Now, there are treatments for RAD, but it's something that you carry through adulthood, okay? It's very, well, the symptoms and the diagnoses are completely different, so I'm not going to compare on that. But similar to borderline personality disorder, there's not really ever good treatment for it. Like, it's something that... My camera stopped. I was at the 30-minute mark. Um, but much like borderline personality disorder, which we don't talk about this part of it much when we talk about it in the public eye, is that similar to borderline personality disorder, there's not great treatment for it, okay? And any clinician will tell you this, that it's kind of something, there's things that you can do to, to, to maintain it, but there's not great treat. I mean, it's not something where if you do this treatment, that it'll be gone. It's something that you live with for the rest of your life. Okay. And there's actually rad in adults as well. So I want to go in here and I read you, want to read you some of the other things that I have on here. Okay. Adults with rad often have trouble with complex emotions like trust, compassion, remorse, and empathy, making it extremely hard to develop healthy adult relationships. If not treated, RAD can have a negative impact on a child's physical, emotional, behavioral, social, and moral development. Children with RAD generally are at higher risk for depression, aggressive behavior, aggressive and or disruptive behavior. Which is a lot of what we see in part one of the Curious, Ca Curious Case in the Tiger Grace, okay? Um, and I think that that is important when you talk about this. Because two of the things I think are important that they, they just kind of glide over and don't really talk about. In fact, the second part they don't talk about at all is that they don't really talk much about our diagnosis of RAD. Okay? Now, you have attorneys in this show. You have medical professionals in this show. You have this person, this woman that's like kind of narrating the whole show and everything like that. But she And she talks about the RAD diagnosis. But you don't really ever have a therapist sit down and say, this is what RAD is. This is how it happens. It happens from a lot of people that are adopted. Not all but some that are adopted, that grow up in chaos, or that grow up in the foster care system. Especially, we have heard a lot about RAD being from cases of people that are adopted um, it, from foreign countries like Russia that are in orphanages before they come here. We've heard a lot about that, okay? If you research it, you'll know a lot about that. So the fact that they don't do have anybody sit down, did I miss that episode where they did that? Because they, they are constantly reaching out to experts. Did you have a rec expert that talked about, Natalia, you, you talked about Natalia Grace's diagnosis of RAD, and she talks about it briefly, but did you ever go in and have a therapist sit down with Natalia Grace and talk about her diagnosis of RAD at length? You have an FBI agent, you have a therapist at one point that comes in, but the other thing that you don't do, don't do is you don't show the extensive therapy that Natalia Grace has gone through at this point in her life. In fact, I don't even know, having watched both series, if Natalia Grace has gone to extensive therapy. You would think that a girl that had been in three adoptive homes, okay, had been in an orphanage in Russia, had experienced abuse in the orphanage, okay, had been given up by her adoptive mother that now is reaching out to her and she doesn't want any part with, that had suffered neglect, abandonment, possible alleged sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and verbal abuse might have a need to be in some kind of extensive therapy. Now, I don't know if Natalia has refused that or not, but they don't talk about that at all, okay? You would think that they would at least say Natalia was offered therapy and she refused it, okay? But they don't go in and talk about that. No, we continue with the story of Natalia is this horrible person, right? So I go in and I watch this documentary. And um, uh, so, well, first of all, this attorney of Michael Barnett, it's very interesting to me this attorney for Bar Michael Barnett that constantly, and I know that he has, you know, uh, client privilege, uh, you know, confidentiality and things like that, but has a lot to say about Natalia Grace, okay? So you're an attorney defending this man, which I totally understand as an attorney's point of view, but indirectly putting down a nine-year-old child, okay? A nine-year-old child. Uh... Interesting to me. That's interesting to me. That you have an attorney on camera putting down a nine-year-old child. So, at the beginning of this, Natalia Grace sits down and meets with Michael, okay? Her new adoptive, or soon-to-be adoptive father, who is a pastor, is there as well. Th this uh, man's pastor. And um, Michael Barnett 
she asks him something and he starts losing it and the pastor says something to him and whatever and then Michael storms out. It's this huge, it's this huge production, okay, of like, let's have all the attention of Michael Barnett. He gets in his, his race car and he speeds off and all this kind of stuff and the attorney says that the father pastor speech was unusual to say the least. And I'm like, unusual to say the least? Like he's protecting Italian Grace at this point, right? Thank God somebody's protecting Natalia Grace because apparently none of these adults, including the production team, gives a rat's ass about Natalia Grace, okay? Then it goes on and it talks about how Christina's now had, oh, no, I said Christina's now had two series to come out and talk. It goes in and talks about this pepper spray um, for not knowing high school math. She was seven years old, okay? Natalia Grace alleges that at seven years old, she was told to be doing these math problems, these high school math problems, because... The backstory is Christine Barnett had believed that she turned her son into a genius. Okay, he ended up going to college early and all this kinds of stuff. He's in the first part of the series, not really, he's not really in the second part of the series, except for one scene where they reference it. And um, and his story is equally as sad. Okay, you can tell. I mean, well, not I wouldn't say equally as sad. This kid has gone through it though, too. You can tell. So she believes, Christine Barnett believes, that she has turned her son into a genius. So she writes this book, okay? Much of the alleged information is that Christine Barnett wanted to adopt Natalia Grace so that she could turn her into a genius, and then it would go and she could prove that she could turn somebody into a genius, okay? When she realizes that that's not the case, there's no point for Natalia Grace to be around anymore. In fact, Natalia Grace is a burden to her, okay? So she is having her do these high school math problems. Natalia Grace is seven years old, okay? There's no way she can do high school math problems. So the fact that she can't do them, Christine Barnett, allegedly, per the words of Natalia Grace, pepper sprays are in her face. Now, I can't imagine at 51 years old being pepper sprayed in my face. I never have, thank God. But I can't imagine at seven years old being pepper sprayed in your face and being told that if you, like it's gonna continue if you don't, I mean, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable to me, right? Um, then Natalia goes on to say that she wonders if they didn't want her because of the surgeries and the long recovery process. And so I'm sitting here and I'm watching that and I'm thinking, you know, it's interesting because it's this complex situation of this child that you have that she's at seven or eight years old wondering if they don't want her because she has to have all these leg surgeries and things like that due to her dwarfism. And she's wondering at seven or eight years old if they don't want her because of the surgeries and the recovery process. That's kind of a complex thought, right? For a seven or eight year old. I don't know that I would have thought that at seven or eight years old. I would have thought, am I not lovable enough? What's wrong with me? And you can see that Natalia Grace carries that through her entire life, right? So at seven or eight years old, again, she already felt unwanted. So you have a child that was given up for adoption, lived in an orphanage, came to the United States, given up by one family, and now she's in another family that doesn't want her. Okay, but we wonder why she acts out. I mean, if this were anybody that wasn't Natalia Grace that was accused, like the orphan movie, of standing, because she compares it to the orphan movie, of standing at the end of her parents' bed, adoptive parents' bed with a knife in her hands, which Natalia says never happened. Michael swears it happened and she said it never did. But Michael also lies straight to his teeth through her based on evidence that they know. He lies right to Natalia Grace and they never step in and say anything about it. They just let him get away with his lies. I'm like sitting there and I'm watching this. I'm like, this is baffling to me, okay? That you, the production team is not questioning more. They question Natalia. They question these other people, the doctors, but they never put Michael Barnett on the spot and question him about the lies that he says to Natalia Grace. They just let her get away, let him get away with it, right? It's so sad. And you can also tell at this point that Natalia Grace also, like when she's sitting down with him, she seeks love and acceptance so bad from anybody that she just, like she's buying into the story that Michael Barnett is giving her, number one, because he's a master manipulator, but number two, because she just wants some kind of acceptance to make this period of her life make sense to her. It's so sad, you know? Um, then Michael playing the victim. He's it's just he's so bizarre. Um, I mean, he's literally like an unhinged child. It's like, I'm sitting there watching it. I'm like, you need to grow up. Like, seriously, you need to grow up. Um, then it, she says something about Christine convincing her at seven um, that she had had her period. Um, I mean, this is like so much more bizarre than the first season that came out. You know, I mean, it's like all these different things we're finding out now about what really happened in the home. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, which this is interesting to me, that we have a international documentary series where a girl is talking about the fact 
that her mother, okay, her adoptive mother, which was her mother at that time, is forcing her to use a tampon at seven. Is that abuse? I, I'm just asking. I, I'm pretty sure that's abuse. I, is that not? Like, if that happened on your street and you heard about it, would you not believe that that was abusive? I mean, it's unbelievable to me that people, like, are still, like, oh, Natalia Grace is the bad one and all of this, right? All these neighbors said things to Natalia, like, um, wait, um, said it, like, like wanting to set that... Okay, oh, this is the thing I was going to say. Like, they were talking about, in the first se season, about Natalia Grace was, like, trying to set the house on fire and do this and all this kind of stuff. Did those neighbors retract their statements? Now, we hear from one neighbor that Natalia confronts, okay? And basically what that neighbor says is, I'm really sorry that I believe Christine's story. I was scared of Christine, okay? So, in the first season, you can't believe anything that that woman says. And that woman, that mother of a child that was friends with Natalia Grace, comes so hard for Natalia. But her word in season one means absolutely nothing because in season two, we find out that she did it because she was scared of Christine Barnett, okay? You've got all these people scared of Christine. Christine Barnett. Doing what Christine Barnett wants them to do, okay? Believing what Christine Barnett wants them to believe, okay? Who's suffering? This child over here. But there's all these people that are coming out and saying these things. The neighbors across the street, this woman, whatever. Are they, like, retracting their statement? This woman never says on camera, I retract everything that I ever said in that first thing, you know? She just, like, makes all these excuses. I'm like, come on now, right? Um, so then they talk about the LaRue Carter thing, Okay? Now, when I watched this in the first season, okay, of her, and she said she was sent to LaRue Carter, I was like, I don't think you really understand this unless you live in Indianapolis, Indiana, okay? And I don't even know that a lot of people in Indianapolis would know this, all right? Did you ever see American Horror Story Asylum? That's what I think of when I think of LaRue Carter, okay? LaRue Carter is not a psychiatric facility where you pay to have your child sent. LaRue Carter is somewhere where they are, like, court-mandated or ordered to have somebody there, okay? It is not where I would want my worst enemy to be, all right? I would not want my worst art person to be at LaRue Carter. I have known people that today are very, very healthy, that went to LaRue Carter. First of all, it's a hands-on facility, okay? And it is, I mean, I have had people that I knew that worked there that said that they had to quit. It was too much for them. I knew people that, like, were counselors, nurses, and things there. It was like, it is unbelievable. You cannot even imagine it, okay? So when I'm watching it and she gets sent to LaRue Carter, I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe this, right? And this is my opinion based on what I have heard around Indianapolis. Just put that out there. When I'm watching this, I'm like, it's interesting to me that they don't talk about the reputation of LaRue Carter, okay? It's not like a wonderful, it's not like the Mayo Clinic. It's not like, we have Riley Hospital in Indianapolis, which is one of the best children's hospitals in the world. They, it's not like they sent her to Riley Hospital, okay? where she would be taken care of with a team of clinicians and doctors, they sent her to LaRue Carter, okay? It's literally, like, a, it, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable to me that they sent her there, okay? When I've heard stories about LaRue Carter, I mean, since I was 20 years old, all right? Then it goes on, and in this first part of the series, they talk about all these accusations of her like trying to have a boyfriend trying to all this kind of stuff and she's like when they confront her with this information in the second part of the series she's like where did that what are you talking about but nobody from LaRue Carter retracts their statements they don't interview for anybody from LaRue Carter and say did you know that at the time that she was there she was actually nine years old she was actually seven or eight years old okay when she was at LaRue Carter when all the workers at LaRue Carter okay weren't believing the patient. They were believing the parents and they were accusing her of trying to have a boyfriend at seven or eight years old, all right? A, a person with, that was possibly sexually abused, okay, is trying to seek out male attention for validation in a treatment facility. The fact that you even had, because one doctor, okay, who they don't interview, they don't talk to this one doctor or anything in there about his willingness to, uh, they, they like have some voicemail from him or something like that. No, he needed to be on camera. You are solely responsible with these parents for the aging up of Natalia Grace and the abuse that she suffered, okay? I mean, seriously, like you need to be on camera defending yourself on why you thought it was okay to age her up. Not like a voicemail message or a note or something like that. Put your face on camera. Let's see you. Let's see you talk about it, you know? My leg is cramping up. I didn't think this video was going to end up being this long. My videos are long, but I didn't think it was going to be this long. You know? So I'm watching this, and I'm like, this is, like, unbelievable to me. 
There were a lot of other resources in Indianapolis, Ohio. I mean, we have Louisville, Kentucky that has a great children's hospital. Ohio has great children's hospitals. We have great children's hospitals all over the Midwest. Riley Hospital in downtown Indianapolis, like I said, is one of the most fantastic children's hospitals in the world. It also has psychiatric unit, okay? So why would you not send her there? Why would you choose to send the scariest place in the world? It, you saw pictures of it. That does it no justice, okay? I'm just telling you right now. So anyway, that was something that really stood out to me. Um, then the neighbor in the apartment complex that apparently sticks to her story. She's like, no, she's 22. No lady. She was, her blood was sent to a diagnostic center and it was proved that she was not 22 years old. Okay. I know you want to believe what you want to believe. But anyway, um, but there was a point in the series where I felt like she wasn't being 100% honest. Okay. And this was the point where I was like, okay, if Natalia Grace at 20, 22 years old now is not being completely honest about the story, because I felt like there were parts about that, I felt like there were things she didn't want to say, and I kind of wondered why she wouldn't want to say it, and I have to believe that Natalia Grace has a certain amount of shame through everything that she's gone through. We know that victims of abuse often feel that they are to blame for what happened to them. When you have a documentary series out there that's six parts, okay, that is blaming you, and you know that you were a child at that point, but that documentary series is indirectly blaming you for what happened to you. You already have that in your head, and then all the viewers in the world are believing that as well, okay? It probably makes you, to some degree, I would think, if I were an Italian Grace, would make you think, well, am I to blame for the abuse that I've suffered? Am I a horrible person? You know, do I deserve everything that's happened to me since I was an infant and rehomed over and over and over again? Like, I mean, it's just unbelievable to me, right? Um, you know, then it goes on and, um, when they, when they meet, he doesn't want to talk about certain things because they're too emotional. He's like, I don't want to go there. It's too emotional. Too emotional for who, Michael? She wants to talk about it. It was the abuse that she suffered at the hands of her wife and you were complicit in watching it. Okay. So if it's not too emotional for Natalia Grace, get the fuck over yourself and start talking about it. Okay. You're a grown adult. You owe this to her. She was your adoptive daughter. All right. You owe it to her. He won't talk about certain things. Right. And he's like, he says to production, you know that there are certain things I wouldn't talk about. So basically Michael made a deal that for him to be in the second part of the series, he would only talk about certain things on camera. Okay. Which basically ties the hands of Natalia Grace because there are certain things answers that she's never going to get from this man, all right? Well, what she's going to be forced to do is put this man in a court of law so that he has to answer it on a stand because now there's so much that happens, okay? Because when he's saying stuff to her, they then later show police investigations and things like that that prove that what he was saying was not true. They show text messages between he and his wife that prove that what he told Natalia Grace was not true. In fact, I kind of wondered if Natalia Grace's purpose for doing the second part of the series, because they paint such a bad picture of her at the end, wasn't to get him on camera saying things that basically perjured himself in the first case, okay? Because if she could prove that he perjured himself in the first case and things that he said weren't true, then she would have grounds for another case. I kind of wondered if she wasn't doing that. And if she did, props to you, girl. You deserve it. You deserve another case, okay? She confronts him about the knives and he won't back down about saying that she had these knives in her bedroom and stuff. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Let's just say she had these knives, okay? She talks about how there's no way she could have, like, the bed was too high. There was no way she could have even gotten on the bed. I mean, you know, at that point, like, the first season, they painted this picture of, like, the, them being so afraid. And I'm, like, thinking back on this, and I'm, like, she's talking about She's, like, I couldn't even reach the top of the bed. And I'm thinking of this, you know, child standing there at seven years old, okay, with her height, holding this knife, and they're in bed, huddling for their, I mean, what are they going to do? What's she going to do? Like, you know, poke at their toes? Like, I'm sitting there, I'm, like, she's so right about this, Right? Like, this first series completely sensationalized the story to make it out like Natalia Grace was murdering the neighborhood or something, right? She's literally a seven-year-old child with dwarfism that can hardly walk across the street. She now has to have $10,000 specially made shoes, right? And still struggles to walk. So, I mean, it's unbelievable to me some of these accusations. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know that if I were seven years old with that mentality and the emotional development of a four or five year old and I was being abused on that level that I wouldn't have knives sitting under my bed too to protect myself who knows what was going on in that house I don't think we'll ever know fully what was going on in that house to find out later that he won't talk about his kids and what they did but apparently allegedly the kids did things to her too at, because uh, her adopted mother was telling her to do those things I mean like okay 
Then the attorney brings up the issue of how her biting her sister is a defense. Now, this is when she moves into her new home, okay? And they put this little girl, and I thought this was abusive, okay? They have the little girl from the man's family talk about Natalia Grace and how she bit her, all right? And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay. Now, you got the attorney, okay, who is defending a man that was complicit in watching his wife. He said that he watched it, okay? Michael Barnett has said that he watched his wife do these things. That's fact. He said it, okay? You have an attorney using a little girl saying that her sister bit her, all right, as a defense that she's a horrible person against two grown adults when she was seven years old. What's the attorney's take on them re-aging her? Oh, they won't talk about it, right? Nobody will talk about that. Because if they talk about that and they admit that they were wrong and that she actually was seven years old, then it implicates them in child abuse. And they won't talk about that because they won't, they're not willing to go there, right? Because it implicates guilt. So they can't go there. So the attorney has to do the only thing he can, which is put this poor little girl on camera. And they like, you know, and the production team puts this poor little girl on camera and says, I don't want to tell this about my sister and whatever and all this kind of stuff, right? And I'm just like, what? Like, what is your purpose for this show? Can we, like, talk about the shit that happened in Talia Grace? I don't think it's right that she bit her little sister. Don't get me wrong, okay? I don't think there's anything right about that whatsoever. But why are we continuing to paint this picture, all right? Not to mention that if they had gone in and talked about her diagnosis of RAD at any extent, okay, it might make sense why she was disruptive, why she was angry in this new home where she was looking for validation. Was it she was jealous of her little sister? Was it that she was angry she wasn't getting all the attention? Because those are things that my friends that have RAD have told me that they felt when they were in foster care homes and things like that. Would it have made more sense of maybe why she acted out? Or is it just used as another piece of evidence to paint Natalia Grace as a horrible person? And I think that that's the intent of the series. Um, so, um, what else did I say? So this attorney that his client self-admitted that he witnessed her against child abuse and never reported it or stepped in because he was afraid of losing his kids. But here's my thing. I've had so many friends of mine that have been adopted in their lives that and I've known so many people that are, that some have found their adoptive parents, some have no desire to, but see their adoptive parents are, they're like, those are my parents, okay? It's not about my biological parents. Those are my parents. That has been the consistent story I've heard from almost every person I've ever known in my life that is adopted. So Michael Barnett wouldn't step in to protect Natalia Grace because he was afraid of losing his children. Was it Natalia Grace, his child? What you implicated yourself in, Michael, was you never saw Natalia Grace as your child. So if you never saw her as your child and Christine never saw her as her child and her brothers never saw her as their sibling, what was Natalia Grace to you guys? A purpose to write a book? I, I, don't, I don't understand, okay? But you admitted that yourself, Michael. You said you were afraid of losing your kids. Were you afraid of losing Natalia Grace? Because she was your child too, right? It's disgusting to me, right? For all the parents out there that have adopted children that are amazing parents to this day, the fact that you, in your own words, never saw Natalia Grace as your child is disgusting. So then I go in about this reactive attention attachment disorder. That's when they talk about it. Michael said the therapist said that rad kids needed to be um, uh, boot camped like they were in the military. Now, I know a lot about this disorder I from people that I know that have it. I have never once heard anybody say, and I don't know why they didn't get this therapist on, on the television series to show it. I've never heard anybody say they need to be boot camped, okay? Never in my life have I ever heard that, okay? And I actually went in and I looked at different therapeutic techniques for RAD, and nowhere does it ever say anything about boot camping them. But that's his defense, okay, against why they treated her the way that they did. Michael continues to say um, that he was abused like Natalia, but you're an adult, Michael, an adult, okay? And then the attorney says that she needs to take accountability. The attor this attorney to me, this attorney to me is unbelievable, okay? That he says that Natalia Grace needs to take accountability. For what? She was seven years old, okay? Are you going to get in a court of law and tell a seven-year-old? Put a seven-year-old up in that stand today. And look at that seven-year-old that is being abused in her own home. And tell her that she needs to be accountable for her actions, okay? When she's being abused in her own home. 
That to me is like unbelievable to me. That this, that any adult, let alone the attorney of this man, that his defense against this man is that Natalia Grace, at seven years old, needed to take accountability for her actions. Okay, we're not talking about a child stealing cookies from the cookie jar. We're not talking about a child having a fight with their sibling. We're not talking about a child, you know, calling their, their mom or dad a mean name. We're talking about a child that was being physically, emotionally, verbal, verbally abused, neglected, and abandoned, okay? Oh, but Natalia Grace needs to take accountability for her actions. And all of this is my opinion on a public figure because you are in a television series and I have a right to have that opinion on a public figure. Just to, just to clear that up, okay? This is not a documentary about the divorce of Michael and Christine and missed dates and dances because he goes in and he talks about, you know, about like, well, he missed dances and he missed this. And I'm like, girl, who? This is not about... The breakdown of you and Christine and the divorce of you and Christine and what you missed out on. This is about Natalia Grace and the abuse that she suffered, okay? Um, and I feel bad that he missed on those things, you know, with his own kids. But your participation in the abuse that occurred is why you missed out on those things, right? Okay, Michael is still making excuses instead of taking responsibility like his attorney thinks that Natalia Grace should be doing, but she was a child, right? But Michael can't take accountability, now, I know you're not going to come out and talk badly about your client, but if you're going to be used as an expert opinion in a TV series, either don't say anything at all or say, and Michael also needs to take responsibility, but you can't say that because you're defending him, right? So then they shouldn't have had him in the series at all. They shouldn't have had the attorney in the series at all, right? But that was more just to sensationalize the story that Natalia is a bad person, all leading up to the last 30 seconds of the series, all right? Michael says he's sorry, but he continues to act like a child. She forgives him. She prays over him. She, I mean, this part to me was like, she has more empathy for him than he can have for her with a situation that she's gone through. I'm like, I mean, the only thing he says is that there's this cross that has her name on there that he saved. And I'm like, girl, who cares about that fucking cross, okay? How about how you treated another human being, how you continue to treat another human being, you know? Um, he says forgiveness is good. Forgiveness wipes it all away. You know, it was interesting to me when he says this. He's like, forgiveness is good. Forgiveness just wipes it all away. You know, I love the definition of forgiveness that says that forgiveness is accepting that what happened in the past happened. Not that it was okay what happened, but accepting that it happened. And what are you going to do so that you are not held hostage to the past, okay? Natalia Grace forgiving Michael Barnett is so that she can continue to move on. It's so that she can continue to live her life, okay? Forgiveness is usually for the person forgiving somebody, not for the forgiven, just to make that very, very clear, okay? It's so that she can move on with her life. Doesn't mean she's going to forget what happened, you know? It's that she's forgiving him. Because she doesn't want to live with hatred and resentment in her heart. You can tell that, you know? So then, okay, it goes to the very end of the show. And it's, it says six months after production, the adoptive parents reach out to production. And that they say that they are done with Natalia Grace, okay? Natal but then it says Natalia's story will continue. The father says on the phone call that they play that something is not right with her, Okay? Now, here's what's interesting to me, that had they played more into it, maybe they will in the third part of the series, had they talked about the therapy that they had gone through, the family therapy that the new adoptive parents gone through, I mean, they show extensively the court proceedings of the mom saying, I'm your new mom, and the dad crying because he's her dad, and her being so excited about being adopted in the courtroom and all this kind of stuff. They go and extensively show all that, right? Was there any family therapy that occurred? Did, they didn't ever reference that or talk about that. Maybe briefly. Did you talk about the family therapy that you had about adopting a child that had, you know, reactive attachment disorder? Of what that looks like in adulthood? Of how you cope with that in a family? Did you guys ever talk about that? Or did you just call production six months later and say, well, we're done with her? Which now it's coming out on social media that they're taking pictures with her. So now is this family adopting her for the hype? You know, is it another family that's using Natalia Grace? So they can be part of the third part of the series and paid for whatever they're part of, paid for all of this. When people that are objects of documentaries usually are not paid to begin with, is it the notoriety that they're getting off of all of this? That they're the saviors that are coming to save Natalia Grace, but in the last 60 seconds of the, sh the whole series, you say you're done with her? I mean, the whole situation is just so sad to me. 
I'm, and I put on here that at the very bottom, I put this is a video for people who have watched the series. You know, I'm not, like I said, I wasn't gonna go in and talk about the history of all of this. And this is just my opinion about all of this, right? But when we are living in a world, <laughs> I'm not a big believer in coincidence in life, okay? I'm just not. And I'm sitting there as somebody that covers pop culture issues and is very interested in pop culture issues. And I see that Gypsy Rose Blanchard, okay, who had a mother that had, you know, Muchasm by proxy that abused her, that she is being lifted up. And the defense says that the only option that she had was to hire somebody to get rid of her mother, okay? And she served her time in prison. Now, I said in my video the other day, she did her time, let her go live her life, okay? Do I believe that she deserves popularity over that? No. But we have Gypsy Rose Blanchard, Blanchard that was complicit, okay, in, in what happened to her mother, being lifted up and popularized and given fame, okay? We have Natalia Grace, who murdered nobody, was, had stories made up, and has given, been given a horrible reputation when she was a seven-year-old child, abused, neglected, abandoned, okay? And yet she's continuing to have to defend herself. Go look at their social media. Natalia Grace has very, very little. Gypsy Rose Blanchard is on a... My camera stopped again. Natalia Grace has very little. Natal Gypsy Rose Blanchard has social media on a huge level, okay? In fact, came right out of prison and started her social media, okay? has a book that's coming out, has a new series that's coming out about her, you know? And so I'm wondering why as a society we look at these stories differently, you know? Natalia Grace is a horrible person because she stood at a bed that she couldn't even reach the mattress on with a knife in her hand in a home where she was being horrifically abused, neglected, and then finally abandoned to two separate apartments when she was seven to nine years old to fend for herself. But she's a horrible person, and we continue to engage in this story, okay, at the expense of the sensationalization of production, but Gypsy Rose Blanchard is lifted up? I'm baffled. I'm baffled, okay? But if we're going to watch the story, the story of Natalia Grace unfold, and I will continue to watch it because I want to see what production does with the next part of the series. But if we're going to continue to talk about the story of Natalia Grace, okay, I think that we need to remember what age she actually was, which she proves in the second part of the series, okay? At the time that all of this occurred. I think we need to remember that she had a diagnosis of reactive attachment disorder and what that looked like in a child of her age, why it occurred, and the events leading up to it for her to have that. I think that we need to also look at what that looks like in adulthood and why she may still be acting the way that she's acting today. And hopefully, Natalia Grace will get the help and the love that she deserves. Because I do believe that she deserves all the love in the world. Until proven otherwise, okay? If they come out in a series and they say, no, she was 25 at the time, then that's a completely different story. But at this time, based on the evidence that I've been given and what I've seen, I've seen that this is a highly sensationalized production at the expense of the life of Natalia Grace. And it makes me very, very sad. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comment section below. I love you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.